Continuing with the uh, magazine games uh, coverage on this channel right now, um, I thought I would do something a little bit different, um, something that I'm really excited about actually, um, and that is to show you the uh, new volume of the game Basileus, or for Greek, Vasileus, um, which is a um, game series uh, published by Via Victus, which is a French magazine, war game magazine, very similar to C3i. Um, they're pretty well known outside of France, but that's their main market. Um, they have done, uh, they have a number of series of games. You can get some of their games through GMT. Um, they're a, a generally a global war game publisher, even though all of their games are designed uh, or at least published in France as well. Um, this is the latest issue of Via Victus, number 162, uh, 162, if you're French. Um, and I picked this up, um, ordered directly from Via Victus because, uh, someone in the Lovian campaign discord, um, pinged me knowing my love for Byzantine history and, uh, let me know that the game that came in Via Victus was Basileus II, um, which is, um, it uses the rules from a system called, uh, a la charge which you can see here, which is um, a system designed for tactical battles from late antiquity to late medieval period. Basileus, so you can see, it, this looks like it's volume five of Allah Charge, so there have been five games with that rule system. Um, Basileus II um, is the second uh, Middle Byzantine uh, game, and so each game comes with four or five scenarios. Um, the first of these games, I believe, came in uh, Avaya Victus number 132. I'll get to that in a second. But I wanted to show you this because uh, it's it's uh, pretty cool. So um, I'm, I'm a big fan of Via Victus's production. Um, I own several other games from Via Victus uh, from another medieval series they have called Au Fil de la Paix, uh, By the Edge of the Sword. Um, they've got a lot of Hundred Years War Battles um, in that system, and I've picked up a bunch of them. They're little folio games. I got them mostly through GMT, I believe. So um, this is the magazine. I'll flip through it here real quick so you can see it, and then we'll talk about what we're doing here. As you can see, it's all in French, so you would have to be able to speak French. I am okay at French, uh, but you can see that some of the articles here, uh, there's about ASL. Um, and, you know, it covers everything, basically, wargaming. Um, very similar to C3i. Here's an article about Storm Above the Reich. So, you know, they don't cover just French war games. They cover, um, uh, like, war global war games. Here's an article about the Deadly Woods, uh, which is a game that we will play on this channel at some point. Here's one about OCS Third Winter, which is very cool. Um, it's a really nicely produced magazine. It's laid out uh, quite um, beautifully. I love the way that the, the photographs they use um, in the magazine. And... Um, I was a little better at French. I might even attempt reading it, but it is nice to kind of look through here and kind of practice, I guess, a little bit. Here's Waterloo Solitaire. Um, there's a, they have a bunch of articles. It's actually a fairly significant um, magazine, um, and I would have I would have loved to be able to read this article, which is um, this translates to uh, the Golden Age of the Byzantine Army um, from Revenge to Resurgence. Oops, excuse me. Um, and so you can see some of the lovely artwork in here. You can see the Byzantine cataphractoi. Um, standing here against what looked to be Arabs or Turks uh, cavalry. Um, so this is a huge article about the Middle Byzantine military. You can see here some of the, uh, they use actually some historical artwork. Um, this is from uh, the Madrid Skylitzes. Skylitzes was a, a Byzantine historian um, who wrote a manuscript about the history of Byzantium. Um, here is, uh, here's a little inset about another peril, the revolt of mercenaries. And so this is probably talking about, yeah, I can see here, uh, Bayeux, that's Roussel de Bayeux, famous from the Battle of Manzikert, talking about how Norman mercenaries were very un, um, unreliable, <laughs> uh, to the Byzantine army, but they employed them, um, heavily against the Turks. Um, it looks like this is about, um, it looks like it's just in general about the middle Byzantine period, some gorgeous artwork here, um, and then it talks about what happens after Manzikert, what happened to Constantinople. Uh, I would really love to get an English translation of this. Um, and here's a bibliography of some reading. Obviously, I'm designing a game about this specific topic right now, so this would be great to, to read. But in general, here's Via Victus. And uh, here's a little article about Basileus too, which is pretty nice. Um, so I will leave you, if you're curious, to go to check out Via Victus's website. They also cover minis as well, which is pretty cool. But in general, it's a very substantial war game magazine um, with some great photographs. So that's that. And so why was I excited about this one? Well, Basileus, Middle Byzantine History. Here's the, uh, here's the scenario book for Basileus II. This particular module of Basileus comes with five battles. 
Um, and uh, of course, it comes with the Battle of Manzikert. And so this is a battle that has had very little gaming done for it. Um, I am obviously attempting to change that at the campaign and operational level, but we don't have really many tactical games as well. And so when someone told me that Basileus II had the Battle of Manzikert in it, I had to buy this immediately. Um, so this is the scenario book that came with the magazine. Again, all in French, and you may be wondering, well, how the heck am I going to play this? Actually, these are the rules. This is the rule book, but the scenarios come at the end. How the heck am I going to play this? Um, if, if you don't, if I don't read French, well, that's where I am happy to say, here's all the scenarios. So here's the scenarios, uh, Andrasis, which is 960. This would have been, uh, Leo Focus, the emperor or the general, excuse me. Uh, and then we've got, uh, mm, Azaz. So this is the one that we're going to play. We're going to play Azaz. Uh, and it's got Manzikert and anyways, to come back, oh, and here's the um, the terrain effects, the combat table, and uh, the sort of um, retreat table. So all in all, very simple game. The rules, not very long, 10 pages, if that uh, scenario take up the rest of this book. But if you don't read French, how do you play this? Well, thankfully, Via Victus posts their uh, materials for their games that come in the magazine online, and there is an English version of that booklet here. Um, this is the scenarios. So like I was saying, Andrasis, oops, better not take that. Um... Orantes, Azaz, 1030, this is post-Basil II, probably the first big battle post-Basil II and sort of a illust illustrative of um, what the emperors who came Basil after the Basil II were like. Manzikert, obviously, here. And there's sort of a, a what-if scenario from Manzikert about what would have happened if the Southern Detachment um, had, uh, had actually uh, returned to the army before the battle. And Zampo's Bridge, which I am not familiar with, that looks like it might be part of the... Civil War that happened after Manzikert. Yeah, it's um, Nikephoros Votinyatis against um, Roussel de Bayeux's uh, mercenaries, uh, the Frankish mercenaries. So uh, that is an element that takes that happens that can happen in my game. Oops, messed up this setup there a little bit. And uh, yeah, so uh, so anyways, they they make this available for download on their website. Um, this is the scenario book. Uh, and then they've also got the rules for the system, which, like I said, came in uh, issue 132. This is Vasileus Volume 1. This one um, has all of the rules in English. The translation is pretty good. There's a couple of areas where I'm like, what do they exactly mean by that? But again, very simple system. Um, I'm actually thinking about trying to hunt this, uh, this one down. I just printed this out. Um, I'm thinking about trying to hunt this magazine down because it's also got some really interesting scenarios in it. Um, we've got uh, Arcadiopolis in 970, which would have been... Um, which would have been... The Bulgarians, the Pechenegs, and then um, against the, uh, the Romans, this would have been in um, the Balkans. And then we've got uh, the first battle of Durostolon, uh, which is kind of cool. John Simiskis, of course, uh, who is emperor, one of the better military emperors for the Byzantines. The, um, the Rus retreat at Durostolon in 971. Um, so there's three scenarios in there. And then we've got the battle of <laughs> the battle of something. So as you can see, the translation is there's some uh, there's some typos and whatnot. There's a the battle of something in 971. Um, maybe that's the combined Dorostolon scenario. Um, what else we got in here? I stapled this together, so it's a little hard to flip. The Battle of Baroya, which I am not familiar with. This is, I guess, part of the. Um, this is John Komnenos's. Um, battles against the Pechenegs, also in the Balkans, so that's pretty interesting. And then, of course, we have the English, well, pseudo-English version of the CRT and terrain effects on the back. Some of this stuff is translated, some of this stuff is not translated. Um, obviously, river and mountain are pretty easy to understand. Pont is bridge, uh, palisades, obviously, some other stuff I don't know, but... Um, this basically gives you everything you need to play. It's a very simple system. Now, this game came with a fold-out map, uh, A4 size, European size. Each one of these is a single uh, map for a battle. You can see they're labeled. Here's uh, map F. This one is map E. And then on the other side, there's one more. So you play all of the scenarios on this little fold-out, which is pretty nice. So that's what we're going to be doing. Let me uh, fix the setup here, and then I'll show you some of the other parts I really like about Via Victus's games before we jump in. So here's the setup for the Battle of Azaz. Um, you can see we've got the Byzantine Eastern Romans here in blue in the center. Here's their encampment. And then all around the outside, we've got the Arabs uh, from the Mutasid Emirate of Aleppo, who are going to be attacking the, uh, the Eastern Romans. Um, the art on these counters is really fantastic. Uh, they, Via Victus's games, one of the things that drew me to them was their, their map and counter art is, uh, and layouts, in fact, are just very, very aesthetically pleasing. I don't know what it is about the French, but they always have really good style. 
with everything that they do. A lot of the French games that I own have very cool art. Um, and so you can see some of the units here. You've got some mounted bowmen. A lot of the Arabs are going to be light cavalry Bedouins specifically. Um, some of them have ranged attacks. You can see some of those mounted cavalry there. What I really like, um, and here's the Byzantine. So uh, they've done a really good job with this uh, with this game um, in sort of understanding Byzantine military history. So you've got all the different types of um, Eastern Roman military units of the time. You've got, here's the emperor, Romanos Arhiros, or Romanos III, as he was known. He's with the Hetariah, who are a uh, his mercenary personal guard, essentially, and they're very powerful. Flanking him, you've got the Varangians here. Um, and then you've got some Scutatoi, who are sort of the core, um, the core uh, Byzantine infantry. Uh, in this particular battle, I believe they were Armenian mercenaries guarding the camp. And then you've got this wagon train along with these uh, sil siloi, pasiloi, <laughs> I'm not sure how to pronounce it, um, basically archers. Um, and they are guarding this wagon train. This is the baggage train of the uh, Eastern Roman army here in these three hexes. Um, you've got some cataphracts um, and some other various types of uh, the excubitores, who is a sort of elite cavalry. Um, so a lot of, uh, a lot of really cool, um, history here and just the unit types. Here's the, um, Peltastoi, sort of your skirmishers. Um, and what I really like is that, um, with Viavictus is frequently the same units have different artwork. So almost every counter on the game has unique art on it. So for example, these are the same unit, but you can see the sort of silhouette or the image on them is different. Um, and the same is true here of the Varangians. You can see they have different, this one's got a shield, this guy doesn't. Um, was another example, uh, here these archers have different poses on them. I love that. I love that they go through the time to make, um, different art assets for the game. Um, you know, here's even two uh, different light cavalry wearing different clothes in different poses. It's just a really awesome production value that Viavictus does in a lot of its games. It's not just this game. Um, I've seen it in other as well. Um, so we're going to get started playing this. It's a very simple system, and I'll show you as we go through what's going to happen. But basically, historically, so you have some context about what's going here. We are in the year 1030. We are in the northern Syrian desert. Um, Basil II, who was the Eastern Roman emperor, died in 1025 after like a crazy long reign where he defeated most of Eastern Rome's enemies, uh, made them extremely wealthy. And the emperors that came after him were um, not so good. And so here we have Romanos Arhiros. Um, so what has happened previous to this battle is that the Arabs of Aleppo um, were in a battle against um, the sort of general of Antioch, the city of Antioch um, on the Eastern Mediterranean, and um, the Arabs won. And so Romanos, being a new emperor, decided that he was going to march out with a giant army of, uh, of Roman soldiers. He was going to march all the way to Syria and he was going to show the, the emir of Aleppo who is right here. This is um, Shibal Nasir, Shibal al-Dala Nasir, um, who's boss. And his army was about 20,000 strong, um, outnumbering the uh, uh, emir's army by about 10 to 1. Um, and uh, he declined all peace offerings from the emir and decided that he was going to um, essentially show him who's boss. Well, eventually um, there were some complications that I don't want to get into, and the army decided that they were going to retreat back to Antioch, so he gathered up his baggage train and he started to mar march back to the west. Antioch would be this way, Aleppo would be kind of in this direction. And he decided to march, and that is when the emir uh, took his late cavalry force of about 2,000 men and um, decided to attack the Romans while they were on the march. And so you can see here that they've come out uh, and surrounded the column, and they are going to uh, essentially shower the Romans in arrows and uh, try and drive them off and destroy their baggage train. So the game is built very similar to Men of Iron on a sort of route point system. So anytime a unit is eliminated or retreats off the map, their strength value contributes to the army's route score. In this particular game, um, the Byzantine army route score is 28. So if the Arabs can um, exceed that with losses against the Byzantines, they will, uh, Byzantines will lose. And the Arabs army is 26, which is going to be pretty tough to achieve. I think they, the Byzantines probably have to eliminate all these units, which seems like it'll be pretty tough. The CRT is a mix of push-pull and, and step losses. And uh, in this game, rolling low is better. It's also an odds-based system. Although interestingly, in the rules, there's a, there's a um, uh, variant to the game where you can play with the die differential system um, with two dice. And you know how much I love die differential systems, so we're just going to pretend that that doesn't exist. Um, but primarily, this is all clear terrain. This is a desert. You know, also, historically, this column didn't have enough supplies uh, to press the attack, and that's why they were retreating. So um, that's not modeled here. This is tactical, but obviously, there's all this clear terrain. There's not going to be really much in terms of effects in combat. We're going to get a pretty flat odds-based system here. Um, and uh, it's pretty simple. Uh, player one goes, moves, attacks, other move, go, attack, and then we just do that. And the game will last eight turns. At the end of eight turns, if we haven't gotten to the route score, whoever has um, done the most losses to the other side will win. 
And uh, yeah, so let's get going with the Battle of Azaz, 1030. Depending on how quickly this goes, I might also play the Battle of Manzikert after this, because after all, that is why I bought this game. And uh, you'll get a look at a Via Victus title. Okay, so the Arabs are the first player, so they are going to be taking the first turn. I It was a bit of an open setup for the Arabs, so the Byzantines put all of their units in designated spots, and the Arabs have these hexes uh, of where to place their units that they're allotted for the scenario. So I've elected um, on the flanks up here to go heavy into the melee. I've got ranged units here, 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 and here. Want to kind of clear out these uh, little tiny units in front. Um, before we uh, before we charge in, but I did put a huge chunk of the most powerful melee units, including um, Nasir's sort of best cavalry here, uh, with him. Leaders are important in this game. They add their strength to the strength of the unit they are stacked with, um, and they also allow uh, they help morale tests in this game. So, like most medieval games, there's a, there's a morale system in here. Uh, it's actually fairly interesting, and I'm hoping that you'll see some of the idiosyncrasies of it. But um, we'll play, and I'll explain that as we go. But the the thinking here is that we've got these um, these mounted uh, Byzantine sort of uh, uh, flank cavalry unit that's not very powerful. It's only two strength um, here. And since we're going first, um, we want to charge in and attack um, that unit. Now, there's no unit facing in this game, so it almost feels a bit grand tactical in that sense. But in any case, let's go ahead. So when you enter an enemy zone of control, there are zones of control in this game you have to stop. And it's only one unit per hex. So we're going to move up here with our uh, with our very powerful cavalry, see if we can just run off this uh, this Byzantine cavalry. Uh, we've got this unit here. Now, he's got this snake symbol. That means that if he's attacked in melee, there's a chance that he retreats before combat, which is interesting. He's also got a range of two down here. I don't know if you can see that. Let me see if I can zoom in a little bit. There we go. So you can see he's got a range of two for, uh, for a ranged attack as well. Um, so we're going to see what I want to do here. Um, He's probably going to want him to move into range and maybe take some pot shots at the Varangians um, because they're pretty powerful and obviously they're the Emperor's bodyguard. So if we can get the Vikings out of there, we can potentially kill Romanos, our heroes, on the field, which historically almost happened. He was saved basically by his bodyguard and was one of the few uh, people to come back alive from the Battle of Azaz. So let's do that. We, let's get within two. We've got a movement of four. One, uh, two, two. Let's go here. And uh, we'll stop there. And then we've got uh, one, two, three there. And I should be putting charge markers on all of these guys. Um, you know what? Actually, let's uh, let's not charge them. Let's let's charge here against these sort of skirmishers. Uh, we should also be putting charge. I'll put one charge marker here to remember that everyone here is charging. Um, and yeah, let's let's try and uh, let's try and drive off the. Uh, Let's try and drive off these guys. Let's go one, two to here. So this is going to be a charge as well. Then you've got these ranged cavalry. They actually, if they just move up one, if they go like this, um, they can fire at either of those guys, which is pretty nice. And then up here, again, we've got a sort of a weak flanking cavalry unit. I do have to be careful about some of these. Um, I do have to be careful about some of these uh, heavy cav here. Okay, so I just had a, look at, a quick look at the rules. Um, real quick, and uh, you can see here that this cavalry unit has this black horse symbol. Those are the charge capable units. So these light cavalry that I'm using to attack um, are actually not charge capable. So we're going to remove these charge markers. They only are going to be coming to play if the heavy Byzantine cav, these units here, are um, able to charge. I don't have, this is light, this is Arab light cavalry, but we have a lot of it. So um, let's go ahead. You know, I have to be careful about the counter charge from these units here. So I don't want to get too close. I may try and soften them up with some arrows. Uh, so I might do something like this, for example, try and shoot at them. And then I probably want to come down here like that. And I probably want to have this guy in sort of held, held in reserve to make sure that he can respond if there's a, a counter charge that happens. Um, this is probably the most dangerous part of the army. I guess maybe if I was um, thinking more smartly, I would maybe not advance until I see how the rest of this goes. But um, yeah, let's 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 just back it up a little bit, shall we? Uh, we'll we'll hang out here and see what happens in the sort of on, on the right flank of the Byzantine army. Okay, so now we're going to resolve combat. So I'll show you how this works. Um, let's resolve the uh, let's resolve these range combats first, I believe. So these two ranged units are going to fire with three strength each. That's six strength points combining their fire to this two strength uh, peltastoi. That is going to be. Um, a three to one attack, and uh, there's no modifiers, obviously. So we roll the die on the three to one column. Looks pretty good. We roll the six. That's the worst possible roll you can make. We get 
um, an attacker uh, has to do a morale test. Now, thankfully, because I'm doing ranged attacks, and this guy is not a ranged unit, I, and he can't shoot back, I don't have to do a morale test. So that was completely ineffectual um, on that particular attack. Let's do this melee attack here, this hand-to-hand -hand combat. Again, that's going to be 3 to 1, 6 to 2. Hopefully we roll better. I rolled a 2, that's quite good. Uh, so that is a D1. So when we do a hit, we flip the unit over, and now he is at reduced strength. Now I have to check to see if he retreats or not. Let me look at that up. So interestingly, um, if you take a loss, you actually don't retreat. I guess it represents your standing and fighting um, with sort of high morale or high confidence. Well, in this case, uh, that guy took a beating there. So he doesn't have to retreat, um, but he does take a loss. And now finally, let's do this attack over here. So this is going to be 3, 6, and 4 is 10, plus the leader's 2. That's 12 to 2. That's 6 to 1. That is the maximum column, which is 4 to 1 uh, in the game. So let's roll that up. And see what we get there. We, uh, we rolled a five, not the best. That is a defender retreat. So that means that he must go back. Uh, so what's interesting here is that um, when he retreats, if he, if he was next to a friendly unit and he retreats, that, may, that could send his unit that he was next to, even if that unit was not attacked, into retreat as well, which is a really interesting way to model sort of like guys seeing their compatriots like fleeing, fleeing the ground. In this particular case, there's only one retreat path. He's got to go here. And so he's going to do that. Um, and then we can choose to advance after combat if we would like. And I think I will with uh, the Emir of uh, Aleppo to go there. And then we have one final attack here. That's this uh, ranged unit. Um, and I believe what he is going to do, instead of firing on the Varangians like I initially thought, he is because, yeah, he this guy, this guy can fire back the Heterea. Um, he's actually going to fire on this unit that just retreated. So let's, let's do that. Uh, it's a three to two attack. So 1.5 to one. We rolled a two. That is a D1 result. That's really good. So, uh, we forced this Byzantine cavalry unit back. We did a loss to him with range. And, uh, that is the Arab turn so far an okay start. Uh, we're going to go to the Byzantine side of the turn. I'm going to play that out, uh, and then show you what happened. So what's interesting is um, how some of the rules are built into the symbology on the units. I just wanted to show you this real quick. So Romanos Arhiros is stacked with the Heterea. You can see that the Heterea have a red uh, value for their range. They have a range of two, but it's in red. That means that when they fire, normally you'd fire with your strength up here. However, because it's red, that means they only fire with a strength of one. So while he is a ranged unit, um, he is not a very powerful ranged unit. He is much more powerful in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Um, and so the idea that I was thinking was I might fire on this this unit over here, uh, but with a strength with a range of fire of one, he's probably not going to do much. And there's a you know uh, on a on some of these guys like a one to three fire here, um, it's going to be really hard to hit. Uh, the best I could do would be to make them retreat. So um, sorry, you can't see what I'm pointing at with some of these light cavalry. If I fire over here. Uh, it's going to be really hard to do anything to them. So I'm thinking I'm thinking here I might move the Varangians in. I might. I might move this Varangian unit here and then try and see if I can hit this guy before he flees. We'll see. There's a die roll involved with that. And then we've also got this Varangian here, which a one-to-one -one attack in this game is 50-50. Uh, eh, uh, so those are not the kind of odds I like. And also he's protecting this wagon. These wagons are very important because if they get destroyed, they're extra... Um, extra morale loss points for the Byzantine army. So we might just leave him there. I'm going to continue with the Byzantine turn and then show you. One thing I should have done was not ignore the special rules to this scenario. So because we are fighting in the summer in the middle of the Syrian desert, when it is the beginning of the Byzantine turn, I have to roll a 1d6 and then divide by half and round up. So let's do that. Uh, I roll the 1. And what that means is every turn I have to do this roll, and then that many n units must be designated as units that may not move or fight during the turn. Um, they can only defend. So because I rolled a 1, that's pretty good. So I'm going to... And one of those units is allowed to be one of these uh, wagon... Um, uh, uh, wagon train unit. So I'm just going to make it this wagon train unit that can't uh, fight. But what I've decided to do here, um, what I've decided to do here is form up around the wagon train. Um, while my heavy cavalry units, the, the uh, cataphractoi, I believe those are, what are they? Yeah, look like look like cataphracts. Let's see. Yeah, cataphracts. 
Uh, they have charged out to try and hit some of these lighter uh, lighter cavalry up here because they're not really worried about these guys. These guys are fairly weak. I put most of my weak melee units um, up here on this flank. So we're, the Byzantines are going to charge out and see if they can do uh, a pretty large, massive hit to um, one of these targets. I haven't quite decided which one if I split these up. Um, I might split them up just because it's two to one on each of those. Um, so we've done that. We've fallen back with the with these guys who took the brunt of that first arrow volley uh, to protect sort of the wagon train. And then we've moved the, this Varangian and Romanos Argyros uh, with his extremely powerful head array up to attack uh, this uh, missile unit um, and sort of create sort of a, a frontage here that the uh, Arabs are going to have to break through um, and give them some versatility about where they respond. So let's do, I'll, let's do the attacks. I'll show you the attacks. So we've got Romanos. Here, he's got a hand-to-hand -hand strength of four, um, which I believe because he is ranged, let me just double check, usually ranged units when they hand-to-hand -hand are minus one, um, minus one strength. Um, Uh, no, they always use their regular strength in hand to hand because they are a special range unit. Okay, so we've got four, we've got eight here. Uh, the cream of the crop attacking this unit here. So let's see if this unit withdraws. If he rolls a five or a six, he's going to retreat two hexes. Um, he does not. So he is going to have to stand and take this attack, which is uh, unfortunate. <laughs> uh, and this should have been. Yeah, it was. This was not a charge. Romanos's move took him further away from this unit, so unfortunately, it's not a charge. It would have been three to one, but now I think eight. Uh, to three is two to one. So let's roll up that attack. Two to one. We get a six. That's not good. We get an attacker morale test. So all the attackers must undergo a morale test here. Now, a morale test in this game is going to be rolling equal to or less than your strength, which is also your tactical value. The benefit here is that, uh, and by the way, look at what a terrible leader Romanos is. He's a zero strength here. Um, but the benefit here is that a leader does provide a plus one to your morale. So let's test uh, the Heterea first. They need to roll a four or less. <clears throat> A plus one or a minus one? I would guess it would be a minus one. Um, that may be a, a weird artifact of the translation. Um, oh, it adds plus one to his, his tactical rating. Yeah, so it's effectively a minus one DRM. Uh, so this guy, because he's a four, needs to roll four or less, but it's actually a five. He actually just rolled a five, so he passed the morale test. Uh, this guy here also needs to pass one, and again, that's going to be five or less because he's near Romanos. He passes easily. Um, so not a great attack by the Byzantines, this uh, horse archer, pretty powerful. Um, I guess I should have moved him probably away as well. I, I guess I could have done something like this with the, with the Roman line. Let him get back here to try and recover. Yeah, that makes more sense. Okay, um, let's continue. Uh, so let's do these charges up here. So I've decided that I'm going to do this charge against that guy. So that is going to be a, um, oops, sorry, I shouldn't take the turn die away. That is going to be a uh, four strength. So it's three, but because he is charging, he gets plus one. So four to two, that's a two to one attack. Pretty good odds. I rolled a six again. What is it with me rolling sixes recently? Um, again, that's an attacker morale test. So let's check that. He's got to roll three or less. He does roll a three, so he passes that, uh, thankfully. Otherwise, he would have either had to retreat or taken a loss. So that charge is over. This charge here, again, four to two. First, we have to check to see if the uh, ranged unit retreats before combat. He does, actually. He rolls a five. So uh, what that means is he is going to retreat two hexes. Um, he's unassailable, is what this means. Um, and then the charging unit must advance after combat. So he's going to go one, two, back up, and then this unit is going to go here. Um, so we've had a bit of a, a bit of a breakthrough there um, against this flank, um, and that is the end of the Byzantine turn. Very pretty, pretty ineffective, I would say. Um, maybe repositioning was useful. Um, we, oh, you know what? I could have also moved. I could have also moved these baggage trains. So let's go ahead and do that into the camp. And this one could have gone to here. We, we definitely want to not have those be sitting around over here. So we'll do that. Um, yeah. And Byzantine units, by the way, um, are allowed to exit the map off to this edge. Uh, so I guess this is, this is to the west, actually, now that I'm seeing this. I guess, I'm guessing this 
is the west and this is the east, which is kind of counterintuitive, but okay. Um, so if that's the case, let me reset this. I, I may, uh, the wagons are trying to get this way. The Byzantine units are trying to get this way. So let's, um, let's, uh, let's rejigger some of that and uh, get it appropriately tactically sound. And then we'll come back and I'll show you what happened at the end of turn two. So at the end of turn two, we've actually had a very productive Byzantine turn. Uh, these cavalry charges combined with some archery fire up here actually eliminated uh, some Arab cavalry units up there. We had a, a successful volley over here, and then the emperor in sort of his retinue eliminated another Arab cavalry unit. So the Byzantines up to five already, whereas they've only lost two. Um, quite a change of affairs from the first turn. We'll see if the Arabs can recover from that. We're going into turn three of eight. This is a very fast playing system. Not a lot of uh, frills on this one, uh, which is pretty nice, actually. Um, I just wish that... <laughs> I, I just wish that this was on this side of the map and the Byzantines started over here and we're going this direction. It's weird that this is to the west. But anyways, uh, now that we figured that out, I'm making better decisions and I think I have a better uh, sort of a better um, tactical sort of formation here for the Byzantines to fight off these uh, these Bedouin cavalry. Well, turn four was extremely bloody. A bunch of Byzantine units went down. I mean, the combat system here is pretty bloody, I'm discovering, uh, especially when you get really high odds. Um, we've lost uh, the a Varangian guard unit. It has been cut down. Um, one of the Skutatoi has been killed. But the Byzantines are pressing forward and kind of shoving the, the Arabs back. It uh, hasn't been all bad, but a lot of reductions here. This guy's reduced. Um, some reductions on the Arab side as well. Some of that light cavalry has been hit up here as well. This one should have been a surefire thing, and it just uh, was... It, it forced a morale test against him, and then he needed to roll a one, and he actually passed it, which is pretty uh, unexpected. Um, the Varangians down here were the one unit that was selected not to do anything this turn because of the heat. Um, but the Byzantines are basically just trying to drive through this gap right here if they possibly can. The Arabs are probably going to have to swing around here and block them off. Uh, we'll see what happens. We are going into turn five. This has been a pretty quick playing game. Um, and it's been pretty enjoyable, it's pretty light, pretty simple. Um, you know, there's some things that are missing here, like, uh, you know, being able to t target a single hex with, uh, even despite being surrounded by other uh, units seems a little weird. Typically in medieval games, you're forced to attack everybody. Um, but, you know, the, there's some interesting, fun choices to be made, and um, I'm enjoying it. Well, we've just had a bit of a dramatic uh, happenstance here. The first attack on the Arab turn, they went after the unit defending this baggage train. They actually f uh, caused a morale check. That unit uh, took a loss because he failed the morale check, and then the Arabs were able to destroy the baggage because of that. In this scenario, whenever a baggage train unit becomes um, destroyed, as it is here, uh, every single Byzantine unit must make a morale check because, uh, you know, basically the supply train has been accessed and, um, and burned in this case. Uh, and unfortunately, it was extremely bloody. It broke three or four Byzantine units from all over the battlefield. And so now we've got an undefended baggage train unit here. We've got... Uh, We've got one here, uh, but it did do it did do hits on a bunch of these units. So now we are in big trouble as the Byzantine player, and um, it's going to mean that I probably should not have moved my baggage train so far forward. I probably should have tried to clear out the troops before moving it through. But I was, I thought I had an avenue here to get through on the next turn, and it, uh, it worked against me pretty hard. So uh, we're going to finish resolving these Arab attacks, and I suspect that by the time this turn is over, uh, the Byzantines will have encountered the de the defeat they encountered historically. Well, we just rolled about the worst possible result for the summer heat roll at the beginning of the Roman turn. Uh, three units are not allowed to move and attack, and that's basically like 70% of what I have left. Um, Romanos here is now trapped with his bodyguard uh, next to this burning wagon. These ranged units are not able to attack or fire. They're going to defend that baggage train unit. Basically, it leaves this Varangian guard unit available to try and do something, and he's going to move away from this Zoc and then probably make his way to try and do something. Yeah, try and join this particular baggage train unit. I don't know that there's a way that we're going to get out of this one alive, uh, because that is the end of turn five. The Roman's not able to do much. Everyone exhausted. Um, the Emperor surrounded. Um and his army shattered um, in the discipline category. Um, actually, this guy could have moved. He could have gone one, two, three. We could have him go there. We're just trying to shore up the, just trying to shore up the, uh, the line if we can. Okay, going into turn six, 
I think this should be a pretty easy. All of these archers up here are going to lay down some fire against uh, probably that unit there. Although we could also, I mean, four to one with just melee combat here. We could do that. Let's do that. Um, we have got uh, a burning wagon, by the way. Uh, I believe once it's destroyed, it just sits there in the hex and does nothing. Let's find out. Yes, uh, you can move over it now. So we're gonna try and surround the emperor and kill him. Um, let's do this. Let's do this. Yep, we'll go one, two to there. Yeah, let's let's ring him in. Uh, and then here uh, we'll move down like this to fire on this guy. Let's try and put him out of his misery. And uh, it's looking very dire. <laughs> Looking very dire for the Romans. So let's do this combat first here. Uh, three, this, it may not even matter. We may not even get to that four. So it is a four to one attack. It's actually, excuse me, it is a four to two attack. The rules tell us that uh, baggage train always defends at a one um, in defense, yeah. Um, so it is a two. So it's a two to one attack up there. We rolled a five. That's pretty good for the Romans. Five is going to be a defender retreat result, which it's allowed to do. So it can go there. And then we could take ground. We'll, well, we'll hold firm there. Just that, that seems good. All right, then let's fire two. Uh, so three, six, and two is eight to two. So that's a four to one archery attack. <laughs> seems very bad. Oops, dice bounced out of the tray. That's a four. It's going to be a morale test for this unit here. So he has got to roll a two or less. To have nothing adverse happen to him, he rolls a four. That's going to make him take a step loss, and that eliminates him. Uh, that puts the Romans now up to uh, 15, 19, 23. And so only five more strength points, and it will be an auto uh, Arab victory. Uh, I am guessing that they kill the emperor this turn, and that's going to mean a, a victory. So let's do it. Let's do the final attack. We've got two, four, and three is seven, and three is ten, and six is sixteen to three. <clears throat> yeah, it's uh, quite bad. <laughs> I think uh, Romano's Our Heroes' days are numbered. And of course, we rolled a one, <laughs> which is a D2 result, which is actually going to kill this unit for three points and kill the Emperor for another four points. And so that is... Shibul al Dala Nasir's uh, the Mirdasid Emir of Aleppo's victory over the Byzantine force at Azaz. And uh, I guess my main tactical uh, questionable decision there was moving those baggage trains into the field of enemy fire. I should not have done that as it was very quick to make the enemy collapse or the uh, Romans collapse. But there you go. That is a demonstration of Vasileus II, a uh, volume in the. Here's the dead pile, by the way. Arabs didn't take many losses at all. Um, in the um, in this system, this uh, medieval system called à la charge, à la charge, and uh, this is the battle of uh, Azaz. So um, you know, I it was a little rough going. I apologize for some of the filming and mistakes I was making, some of the stops and starts. I, I was just it was my first game. I had just read the rules. So now that I've got this, we're going to set up the battle of Manzikert, and I'm going to do a video about that next because it is uh, one of my favorite periods of history, and it is a very interesting battle as well. There's some chrome on this one that I uh, think will be kind of interesting. So. Uh, let's set that up and I will see you in the next video.